Thanks, Bernie. And you got to meet your audio. Uh, all right, start again. Hey, folks, I'm Dave. <laughs> Come on. Hey, folks, I'm Dave. Uh, so Bill and I, uh, back here at Sector, we share kind of a, a fascination for robotics and an interest in learning new things. And so we've been messing around with a CNC foam cutter. Thought we'd kind of present where we were going with that. So we've got a agenda, which is mostly for us. Um, the picture in the upper right-hand corner is somewhat illustrative. That's a cable robot. You might recognize that as the thing that kind of flies over NFL games. And uh, that class of robots is called a cable robot. Basically, it's uh, using tension cables to pull something around, something that I think we both have kind of found fascinating. We took on something perhaps a little bit more modest, and uh, that was to try to build something that could cut foam. So we, we had some objectives for this. Well, first and foremost, I think we both love learning a lot of stuff, cable robots. I had no experience with Linux CNC. Scott is kind of a Linux CNC wizard. He introduced me to that time. Anybody heard of Linux CNC? That's the control system that is used to control most of the tools here at Sector 67. It's an open source program that can take stepper motors and servos and can make them do useful things. So we have a CNC router, the mill in the back, Formac, all those run on some variant of Linux CNC. Um, Bill is an expert at the Raspberry Pi. I'd never used the Raspberry Pi before, so that was something new to me. So, uh, Bill has a real strong software background, so unit testing and things like that were all new to me. Um, mostly wanted to make, have fun, but one of the things we're interested in doing is whether it would be possible to make a, a really, really, really big CNC machine that's really cost effective. So in general, um, if you buy a, like a small CNC machine, it doesn't cost a lot of money, but you buy a really big CNC money machine, it costs a lot more money. So one of the things we're trying to accomplish is can we make a really, really huge CNC machine that's actually really cost effective? And so the approach is what we call the cable, it's cable robot. And some of you may have seen, there was a member of Sector 67 some years ago that did one of these things that could draw pictures. And the basic premise, you can see our little mock-up here. There's two drums, left drum and right drum, and wrap drums, you probably can't see it, is some musky wire, it's an uh, antrum cord. And uh, there's two sets and it dangles down from the left side to this mechanism here and the right side of the mechanism there. And suspended between those two is a hot wire cutter. Basically plugs into the wall, heats up, and it will slice through foam. Um, and so let's see if I go down, here's kind of a section through what it looks like if you zoom in there. There's four cables, two on the left drum and two on the right drum, and we're holding on to this wire here that heats up and we drive it around and the theory is to cut out a piece of foam with that um, using those two wires moving around. And so why would that possibly be useful? Uh, one reason is if you want to cut really, really big objects, so we can, uh, yeah, pass it around, it's great. We can uh, mount those drums any distance apart. We can have them 20 feet apart and just dangle the wire. So it doesn't cost any more money other than a tiny amount of fishing wire to spend further away. So if we wanted to cut out an eight foot section of foam, we could do that with a really big sign, two dimensionally. In theory, if you were really patient, you could cut out a car body by cutting out two dimensional sections and stacking together. And I've actually, I built a small boat a long time ago doing this by hand. I basically, you know, surface the boat in a CAD model, cut every section, every um, two inches, you know, glued a piece of paper on the foam, cut around it with a band. So it was incredibly laborious, but it, it sort of worked. There's one thing to add in here that occurred to me, it might not be apparent. If you look at that design there with those slices, slices being the operative word, if you rotate it that 90 degrees, then we have the same concept as a 3D printer. Make a three-dimensional model slicing into pieces. And then what Dave was just describing is instead of printing each of those slices, we cut each of those slices. So that was kind of the objective. And we, we talked about this for a while, but well, let's give it a shot and dig into it. Uh, the first thing that we did, which was kind of a fun thing, is we designed what's called a hypocycloidal drive. So the basic premise, this is run by stepper motors. For those of you who use stepper motors, you know, you send it a pulse and it clicks, partially revolution. And a typical stepper motor is 200 pulse per revolution. So you can, the granularity is 1.7 degrees, if I've got my math correct. Is that roughly correct? And we've got these drums are about 
they're 350 millimeters in circumference. And so when you click it, uh, one two hundredth of a revolution, that's about 70 thousandths of an inch, we would move the wire, which is way too coarse. You know, it'd be kind of jerking around. So we need to reduce, gear reduce it. And there's lots of different ways to do gear reduction. Gears are the most common way to do gear reduction, right? Is it gear reduction with gear? Um, you do belts, that's pretty common. Um, but there's this really cool thing called the hypocycloidal drive. Anybody heard of hypocycloidal drive here? But there's anybody? There's a couple of people, right? So um, if you use the spirograph, and you, I'm of an age, right? I remember the little tool called the spirograph. That's working in the same principle of a hypocycloidal drive. So we designed a 25 to gun one gear reduction. And uh, hypocycloidal drives are often used along with harmonics that kind of neck and neck for being used on robotics. Um, it accomplishes very, very low backlash. So instead of having a lot of slop in it, they're really, really tight, really small size, uh, very small number of parts, very low backlash. It doesn't use gears, but it uses these hypocycloidal cap, which what is that? We've got a picture of what that looks like. So essentially, it's like a sine wave ground into a plate. And um, there's like this orange thing right there is mounted on an eccentric shaft. I've got a video which sort of describes this. So as this shaft eccentrically moves, you remember when you ran a spirograph, you take a little pen and you stick it, you can swirl your spirograph around in circles. That's essentially what this thing is doing. You're taking this orange plate, you're swishing it around in circles. But the magic here is that there are lobes on the sign plate, 25 lobes in our case, and then there's these pins on the outside, and there's always one more pin than lobe. And so every time you circle this thing around, the um, orange plate goes backwards one twenty-fifth of a revolution. I've got a quick video we found from uh, Sumitomo, the company who I think is kind of, and we'll probably have to watch an ad here. Yes, we will. Sorry about that. Uh, hopefully we don't have to watch the whole ad. I blocked plus on Firefox. Okay, so here's uh, Sumitomo's drawing what's going on. See the red dot moving around in the center? That's the input shaft. And see it's eccentric, so it's wobbling that sign plate around the outside. The red dot on the outside is counter-rotating. And the reason it's counter-rotating is because there's one less lobe on the one less lobe on the sign plate than there are rollers on the outside. So every one 25 revolutions, that thing back rotates one. And you can then connect an output shaft to that rotating sign plate. I think we've got a drawing of what that looks like. So here is what our device looked like. There are two sign plates. And ironically, it works fine with one sign plate, but because it's an eccentric, it would create shaking forces. Probably not a big deal for ours because it turns pretty slowly. But it's pretty common for you to use two sign plates and offset them by 180 degrees. So when one's going up, the other one's going down to cancel out all the vibrations. And the net result of this is that you get a 25 volt gear reduction with very few parts. This entire thing was 3D printed. So uh, that's probably not a great idea. Typically, they would be machined. But believe it or not, it sort of works as a 3D printed element. In fact, we, where we figured this whole thing could probably made scratch for like 120 bucks, like every, controls and everything. So that that part I think is kind of successful. Of course, based on the normal assumption that time is limited. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly right. And yeah, you've got access to sector sixty seven. Uh, yeah. So normally we mentioned the Linux CNC thing here. So the typical way of deploying an instance of Linux CNC to do something like this is that you put it on an x eighty six based motherboard or a full PC that has a parallel board, one of those old things from the old days, and then to get the real-time control for a CNC machine, that you use something typically, some a piece called the masonry, which for us, it added too many dollars, and it would have cost us like $20 more, and it added way too much complexity. And so we experimented and played around with this and found out that we didn't need any of it. We could actually drive these stepper motor drivers with the Raspberry Pi directly. And so the Raspberry Pi was the first unconventional piece of this instead of a full x86 machine. It's running Linux, it's the Linux CNC part, and then it's got user space, real-time functionality. So there is real-time support here. I think for the speed that we're running and what we're doing, I don't 
can't say that we really find a place where we have to have that real time function out. We're just not trying to do something that complex. And then we are controlling the separate loader drivers directly from the GPIO pins of the Raspberry Pi. So we were able to eliminate the need for the, the um, parallel port altogether. We didn't need to do those. And we did we found out originally we experimented, we thought we would have to do some voltage transformer because these guys are typically five volt levels. Everything on the Raspberry Pi is three volts. But once we learned more better how to use these guys, we found out we didn't even need to transform the voltages. We just had to provide a current sink. So we were able to control those from there. There's a lot of other things we learned about the Linux CNC. And it's always very easy to criticize somebody else's code. Because of course, we would have created it better and it would have been more readable. I have that same opinion about the Linux CNC code. It obviously works. It's mature. Everybody's using it. But modern code's written a little bit in, in a different style. And so one of the major things where we spent too much time was that bolded load RT business. This is the Linux CNC way of defining which pins you want to use to provide a particular function. So we needed to do things like provide a pulse for the left motor, provide a direction signal for the left motor, and then the same thing for the right. So when you set up the direction, you use one pin number in scheme in the Linux CNC world. But when you want to say, I don't want to use these other pins, I will leave them available to the operating system, you use a different pin number in scheme. And now that we know that is a fact, if you read the documentation, you can see, oh, so that's what they're saying. That's what it means. But in order to get to creating the mask through the direction argument and exclude, we ended up writing uh, a Python script actually to generate those because we wasted, sorry, we invested way too much time <laughs> trying to figure out, okay, why doesn't this work? We're using consistent pins and it just doesn't work. And finally realized, you, have, you know, you step away and you look and say, oh, they're using the Broadcom numbers for the direction, but they're using the hardware numbers for the other one. Once we did that, we were off to the races. And the last thing, like I said, with all of this, we found out we didn't need the Mesa board at all. So we were able to do something differently than the typical deployment of Linux CNC. Let me talk just real quickly about why what Linux CNC, because I think when we started this, we thought, well, we're just going to run this with an Arduino, which didn't really even occur to us that we'd use this Linux CNC until Scott can talk about it. So, no, he's going to answer. Oh, oh Jesus. <laughs> now we got one good mic here, folks. So the advantages that Linux CNC provided is, first, it has a user interface. That's, it's what a lot of users of this are used to. It gave us a way to see things like this. We could tell that the uh, way we were following the pattern we wanted to cut was tracing out something that looked reasonable. Linux CNC also incorporated all of the real-time control mechanisms, which was something that if we really scaled this up and tried to take it to its maximum velocity, we would have been able to use. And then it does have a good robust implementation of this ability to say, we'll give you all of this other standard functionality that you need for controlling basically some kind of mill. Linux CNC basically assumes whatever I'm driving is some kind of mill and it has some axes and it moves. But then because typically we don't use drums and winches and cables to control our mill, what we did using what Linux CNC offers is you just write the two kinematics functions. One to get from a Cartesian position as an input to what do you want your axes to be? And then in the other direction, the kinematics of, okay, I have a axes value for the my axes in my system. And what is the Cartesian position that will result from that? So we didn't have to write any of that stuff. What we had to provide was those two kinematics functions. 
And once we did some more reading and some reading and some reading and some head scratching, we figured out we don't even need the forward kinematics part because it's not apparent here, but this is a completely open loop implementation. There was no feedback. So that's why we ended up using the Linux CNC. And I would say we would probably agree at this point, it was the right solution. It, it works and it does what we need and the whole lot, a lot less stuff that we need to drive. Yeah, so it's built much. One of the things I think I'm, I'm most proud of in this project is that that transformation between you know Cartesian coordinates and what these drums need to do. And so you know we're all used to Cartesian coordinates, x y coordinates. It's what all mills do, and conveniently you know most mills or routers are set up you know in Cartesian coordinates. You get a motor that controls the x axis, motor that controls the y axis. You want to move ten millimeters to the right. You know, you turn on that motor meter 10 millimeters. We don't have that option with this thing. So we need some way to translate a desired Cartesian coordinates because that's what we're getting out of a program to cut into what that means for the cable. And it's really been cut. One thing that's really super interesting is like, let's say you want to move at a constant velocity. You want to move like five millimeters per second to the left, right? In this implementation, you would just turn on that motor and say move five millimeters to the left. Or left. With this implementation, moving five millimeters to the left means that this drum and that drum are coordinating at the same time, and their rate and velocity is changing continuously to accommodate the fact that you want that cutter to move that way. That's called forward inverse kinematics. So, correct, Bill, on one thing. We did end up needing both the forward and inverse kinematics because Linux CNC won't home the device without both. We're not sure we understand why, but we actually had to solve, no matter how much I pushed the down arrow on your Nothing happens. <laughs> um, it's a kinematics box. So they, they call this forward and inverse kinematics. When the first is inverse kinematics. We start with we want to drive this to some known location in the middle, like five inches over and two inches down, right? Well, that corresponds to some rotation of that drum and some rotation of that drum. Turns out that's just math. You know, we were able to solve that with just like high school trig, maybe freshman trig, right? It's sines and cosines and tangents. And things like that, but it was it was very solvable. The inverse transformation was really interesting. That's the inverse, right? I have a given drum rotation. I've rotated this 15 degrees and rotated that was 175 degrees. Where does the cutter end up? And it turns out that can't be solved with numerical methods. It's a non-solvable mathematical equation. It's it's uh, statically in, or it's indeterminate. And there's a reason for that. These cables are, are wrapping around with an involute profile, and when they intersect, there's no way to solve that. So we use something called a Newton-Raphison method, method, and that is, yes, it named for Sir Isaac Newton, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, Sir Isaac, way back in 1669, came up with this method of solving that problem, which I won't go into detail, but basically it's a guess and check format. Says, okay, let's say that you know we rotate this 15 degrees, we rotate that one 20 degrees. Let's assume that it ends up kind of around there, and then we'll check the error message by pumping that into the equations that we did for the inverse kinematics and see how far off we are. But you're actually checking it relative to the derivative, which is the slope of the equation. And uh, so Newton came up with that 1669 before there were any computers, he came up with this method. It's still one of the most common ways of solving robotic problems like that fancy cobot we have back there is using newton Raphison, which is how do we coordinate all the joints to move that where it is. And we were able to write a newton Raphison equation for the Raspberry Pi. So it's a guess and check. And one interesting thing, it generally converges within four guesses. So you provide an initial guess and it kind of converges and within four iterations, it's within like a 10,000th of an inch, which is kind of amazing. So it's a little bit of math geek. It was it was kind of super fun. I think. Um, unit testing. Yeah. So are we going to get the shepherd's hook here? So it's pretty quick. Uh, <laughs> how many slides you got left? Two. Two. Or just one of them. So unit testing the <laughs> functions that Dave has described. Me while Linux CNC does have a unit testing framework, it's very specific to Linux CNC. They have their own compiler that they run. They put a bunch of garbage. I mean, project description stuff on the front of every source file and their compiler depends on it. So the functions were written using that. So that made it very difficult for us to just concentrate on getting these functions. So I dug into that and created a unit testing framework where we could take that function in the 
source stuff, the source code plus the extras that Linux C and C uses and run it through this. So we didn't even have to go to the Raspberry Pi. We on our development machines, Dave's Windows machine, my real computer, and <laughs> yeah. was able to do the testing. And it, it helped us a lot because we could run through and we were able to demonstrate when we got the functions correct. Finding things like sign mistakes, stuff like negative or the sugar and pot. Um, so here's what it looks like when it runs. Once again, oh, this is, I, I guess this is my video. This is sped up. It's unfortunately it's not this quick, but you can kind of see how it runs. And so we're pretty proud of this. You can see Linux CNC in the right-hand corner. There's the screen showing us what we're supposed to be cutting. And uh, it's kind of magical to see the left drum and the right drum coordinating the velocity. It's a constant velocity, and you can hear the motor spinning up and slowing down as it tries to maintain constant velocity through here. I think this was our first cut. Yes. And it cuts pretty cool. That's so... Uh, we'll call it quits. The question, I guess, what's next? In all probability, we will grow bored of this and move on to other things because <laughs> all our projects are asymptoted 80% and we never get any further than that. <laughs> we put them away. Um, we could conceivably try to bolt these 10 feet apart and cut big foam things. Um, we talked about writing a post-processor program, which would take a DXF file from a CAD program and shove it directly into here, or even a slicer like what they have for FDM systems. The Fusion 360, it used to be called, I forget what it was called, but it was a slicing program for making tall models in the laser cutter. Oh, really? Um, but yeah, it's built into Fusion now. I don't recall what it's called, but I can help you. See, it. then we, well, yeah. put a line yeah. through that yeah. one. Wait, yeah. What? Yeah. wait a minute, let's, wait, why don't we so spend put like... Line through a put solved. <laughs> <laughs> so that was it, a uh, super fun project. And if anybody's got any questions, we're happy to ask or ask them. So if, I love the idea of scalability, but... But you're going to run into, I mean, I assume part of the reason this works is because you're not changing the diameter of the, the drum. Right. If, because the wire is so thin, it's never overlapping on itself. Uh, the, never building up the diameter, never changes of the drum. So therefore, the mass would stay the same, right? Yeah, the design we had actually had spiral grooves cut in the drum, so it followed a constant diameter. I'm not even sure that was necessary. Well, Probably would have just but tracked. But at scale, that's what I'm going at. It's Could like, be. If you, if you want to do something that's 20 feet wide, and, or is, will that, I mean, there's going to be also some other issues with sagging the wire, potentially, but yeah. is that... Yeah. Something you would just figure out the math, and you could potentially be a fatal flaw. Your point is really well taken. Um, you know, we just dang dangle some weights there as Bill's showing. You might not see it, but there's fishing weights on here, and we assume that once as we scaled it, we just got bigger pieces of lead. Then I can pull it down. Yeah, yeah keep it tight. Cable is so small, and that cable is so strong. So there's really no load on a cutter. So it's yeah, that that musky wire, which I've not used before, I, I got that at Doran Hardware. It supposedly has almost like zero stretch to it. It's it's a braided antrum fiber, it's mm -hmm. Kevlar fiber, same thing. So, but but your point is an interesting one in that if the cable wraps, is it going to change the diameter? And uh, I think we just assumed that we would like space it with grooves or with like like a winch. If you ever use the winch, it kind of tends to sort of self track and not overlap. All right, I guess I was on the same line. Does it tend to walk on the drum? Does it grab the ground as well? Would that, does that become an issue? Yeah, could be conceivably, okay. yeah. I'm not sure. Uh, the drums, the, the wires in the drums are 75 millimeters apart, and a typical piece of foam is 50 millimeters or 20, so they're uh, two inches. So there's like 12 and a half millimeters on either side before the cable sort of starts to drag. Okay. Well, it's 150 bucks. What do you expect? <laughs> <laughs> All right, one, one last one for me then. So, Regarding the, I guess the kinematics or the geometry, is the accuracy of it very depending on where on the cutting board you are? Seems like it would. Yeah, you know, it should not. I don't think the math doesn't vary. It could be that you know, to your point, that the cable sag that could be an issue. But the 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 kinematics to translate. One one of the most challenging things about the kinematics is that the cables here are tangential to the drum. And so as this moves around, your tangent point is changing. Our math accounts for that. Oh, sure, sure. No, I guess I was thinking that if you're really tight to one drum, and this oh. moves, a given step would be different depending on how far the one drum is screwed in. No, all, yeah, all of that hopefully should be accounted for in the math. But I also assumed that if we're going to do this, we assumed that it's hard to tell from this picture. Like to cut an eight foot piece of foam, the drums would have to be 12 feet apart. 
So there's always at least some angle. Oh, so you're staying in a window that it's yeah. So so it's not ever like dangling straight down. Any other questions? Anybody need to buy a giant foam cutter? <laughs> 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 yeah. Very cool. We find, and once again, my thanks to Chris and the entire team at Sector. You know, we a lot of, it wouldn't happen without the resources and tools of this place. I'm right. assuming you guys looked at Maslow, the CNC router. The, the I have seen that. Yes. Thing. Yeah. Somebody did a CNC router on kind of the same. It was like at an angle and sort of dangled down. Yeah, that's similar. I, I, uh, no crazy That's gearing true. system though, so you got you got that one. I would encourage everybody to play. So if you spin the knob in the middle of the big drum, you can spin the stepper motor directly, and you can see how the gear reduction. Yeah, I meant to bring up it looks like foil. Yeah, afterwards, if you spin this little knob here, you, if you look inside, you can see the little wobbling swash plates, and it's it's pretty cool. It's the hypocyclic foil. I'm a huge fan of this, <laughs> <laughs> only because they're really cool. Where where's home? In the home. Pardon? How do you home it? That is a really, really interesting problem. We could talk for months about how to home it. Right now, you home it by driving it very carefully to that pencil mark right there and pushing zero. There's no way, and it's really sounds like a trivial problem. There's no way to home this thing conventionally. You can't put limit switches on it because the cables, the left drum and the right drum are interlocked. So normally you home a CNC, you say, oh, take the x-axis and move it to zero and take the y-axis and move it to zero. You can't do that on here because when you before you home it, the left axis doesn't know where the right drum is at. So we literally manually drive it to a point at zero zero and push home. It's a really good question. That didn't occur to us until far into the project. Are there roller bearings in your printed thing? Or there are. Plastic? Yeah, it is. Okay. Yeah, no. There's roller bearings on the uh, on the drum is running on roller bearings and the internal. Um, Sight sign plates are running on. Yeah, from a mechanical perspective, one interesting thing is that those drums, usually you would have to support the front and the back of the drum. We wanted the front easy to just wrap the cord around. So that entire thing is cantilevered off the stepper motor shaft, which is probably a crappy design, but it seems to work. Thank you guys. <laughs>
um, is the virtual tabletop knows where each grid location is. Um, for all of our miniatures, uh, basically I'm building out these bases for them that sit below the mini stream and just attaches to the space. And the real trick of it is that we have a light sensor on this base. And so if this miniature with the light sensor is sitting on the TV and I flash the TV underneath of it in some way, I can convey information of locations into the mini. And then the mini can then send its location to the uh, to the tabletop software. So this is it's literally flashing binary for the location. And so I send a couple bits to say this is your X position. I send a couple bits to say this is your Y position. Um, the TV obviously itself doesn't know where the mini is, but the mini with its light sensor can see this flickering difference and it can communicate back to the table, hey, I'm mini so-and-so and I'm located at X coordinate, Y coordinate, and then we can up to update the underlying system. So first, I thought it'd be interesting to kind of talk through some design constraints as I've been working on this. Um, so I really, uh, in my previous discussion uh, a couple months back, um, I, I kind of just some other ways people saw this, and they have like external camera systems where you build these frames for TVs. Even my initial approach involved like this physical hardware built around the TV. And so I'm try generally trying to constrain this problem or, or implement a solution such that I don't want as, you know, I, I want to reduce the amount of external things as much as possible. Um, so at a minimum, we have a laptop, because the laptop runs this tabletop software. We have TV, because that's what we got. And we have these physical minis. As little extra as possible um, is, is preferable. So if I can manage it, no cameras, I don't want those frames. And if possible, I don't want bridging devices. So, so if you imagine like your smart home stuff, maybe you have like a Z-Wave bridge that makes all these like light bulbs work. If possible, can I not have this bridging device? Um, uh, there's a size constraint. Um, in general, D&D uh, uh, maps and minis are designed for one inch uh, miniatures. Um, so while we're on a digital TV and I can fudge the numbers to some degree, it would be nice if instead of, you know, yeah, I have this one inch mini, but I have a five inch base or something around it. Like that's kind of impractical, like how much map can I show at one time? Um, it's just big and bulky. So size constraint, trying to work towards, can I keep this as close to one inch diameter as possible? Um, and then now this incurs another constraint of, well, how do I power this thing? Um, it'd be nice if I didn't have wires everywhere. Um, but if I'm sitting with you know a one inch base, like that's really, really tiny. So if I'm taking the power with me, I'm probably constrained to some sort of uh, like coin cell battery. Um, unless I want it to be really, really tall, at which point that I could do like a more standard like built in cell that's rechargeable a bit. Um, but it would be nice if it wasn't super tall, you know, again, if we're aiming for something kind of small. Uh, so now we have to fit within a really, really tiny uh, power budget. Um, and then I don't know if I'm ever going to try to commercialize this, um, but I did think it'd be interesting to approach the problem as if I were. And so now I have to consider well, what does it cost, especially what does it cost per unit? Because uh, if I were expecting anybody to ever buy one of these from me, I don't want you to be like, oh, yeah, you and your, your friends are going to buy like four of these and they cost $100 a pop. Well, no one's going to buy that. That's crazy talk. Um, but maybe if they're like 20 or 30, I don't know, maybe that's a price point that people are willing to pay. Um, so trying to design things along the lines of how would I build more than five of these things? Because there is a different design process, right, between building one or two of a thing versus building 100 a thing, even that's different than building, you know, 10,000 of a thing. So trying to design long term processes uh, that, that uh, works for that. So uh, what I'm currently working off of, um, uh, I obviously the TV and the laptop, because those are a minimum. Uh, right now, the bill of materials is actually sitting around $10 a pop. And again, that's raw cost to me. So, so markup exists. It'd be marked up from some point. But now that kind of gives me margin of what could I potentially price something at that people would be willing to pay, um, as well as even if it's only something that I ever made for myself. Again, if I only made it for myself and I wanted four of them, I don't want to spend $100 a pop. Uh, $10 is much better. In truth, if I'm only making like four of these things, I think they're like $20 to $25 in raw materials because uh, you start getting uh, some of the breakpoints on components. Um, 
I do have a design uh, on a circuit board that is sitting at about one inch um, uh, diameter. Uh, power by using a, a, a CR2032 coin cell, which is like the most standard coin cell that you can probably find. It's, it's the one that looks like a board, um, and it's roughly the size of. Uh, that can only provide me like 10 to 15 milliamp uh, at any given point. Uh, so again, power budget has to be really, really low. Um, and I'm fitting all of this onto a uh, microcontroller I I went with for this project with an NRF 52, uh, and specifically the 840 version of that. Uh, really impressive little microcontroller. Uh, it's average current draw because most of the time it doesn't actually need to be actually on. It turns on frequently, but for very small snippets of time, uh, which brings our average current draw with a radio, by the way, into the microamp. Uh, so when I said that I have a couple milliamps to work with, my control actually fits within that. Um, it's fairly fast, uh, significant amount of program memory uh, and RAM. So as I'm coding this, I actually don't have huge constraints on the programming side of things, which is really, really nice. Um, uh, building with the probably two light sensors, um, I, I've, I've marked out four two. Um, the first one, obviously for that, that coordinate information, I had some ideas like, wouldn't it be really cool if like, maybe you're playing something and you're like, hey, I want to give my players like flashlights or something like equivalent. So it de depends on where I'm facing and where like my light is emitting. Um, and so by uh, having a second light sensor and then differing uh, what patterns they can basically see, basically I'm doing a measurement step to determine the rotation. Um, by having the two sensors, I can basically build myself a rotation of where I'm facing. And then for much more rapid, faster uh, detections, uh, I'm including a uh, inertial measurement unit. And so that includes an accelerometer and a gyroscope. The determinant orientation is actually pretty simple off of that, the, the gyro literally measures rotation. Um, but it would have the element uh, or the issues that it would drift over time. Um, so that's where the light sensors can help trim it back down. You also could fix this with adding a, a, a compass module. Um, but since I'm already using the light sensors for the location, Kind of like, where do I spend the dollars? It's like, well, adding one extra light sensor when I'm already using one, a little bit cheaper than adding an actual compass to it. Um, yeah, so as I was kind of going through this, I realized that if I were to try to actually sell this as a product, uh, the government has you know opinions about that. Uh, we're talking, as so I mentioned that we're talking over Bluetooth as our communication, and the FCC and other countries have you know kind of their equivalents. Uh, they regulate radio emissions. Uh, we are intentionally emitting energy into the air around us. Uh, and so getting an intentional radiator certification is like ten to $100,000. Like I found like varying ranges of numbers, but it's not cheap. It's basically the point of, uh, of this. And so I'm like, oh no, like this just kind of like breaks the product. I'm like there's no way I'm ever going to generate enough capital for this. Um, whatever. But uh, if you look into it, uh, the actual like module, you can you can buy modules where somebody else has already paid for that. And, and obviously there's a markup now because they're going to pass some of those costs on to you. But since they're selling like this small little module that can fit into a million and one products, it's really not that expensive. Um, and so if I take a module that has already been produced, and specifically what, what I mean by a module the module is the microcontroller, uh, any uh, hardware required for the antenna, the antenna itself, and the shielding uh, equipment for it. Um, so, so basically, my controller, my radio, as a pre-built module, I can purchase that. Well, if I'm using a component that is already certified, then my entire project as a whole that embeds this component is now an unintentional radiator because I'm not intentionally radiating any energy that module is, and that module is certified. Uh, and that's way cheaper. <laughs> so that actually brings it back to the realm of, oh, this might actually be okay. And uh, there are cutouts for if you're basically doing like prototyping runs, you can do hundreds of units and not even need certification in the first place. Uh, so, uh, so you can basically test out an idea. You can test, make sure people actually want to buy it from you uh, before you actually go through the cost and the effort of getting the lab to test your thing uh, to make sure that you're not unintentionally emitting uh, frequency that you're not intending to. Um, and then just kind of, a, I just have the, the size comparison down there of like 
again, we're trying to fit in a one inch diameter, which is roughly the size of a quarter and they're pretty tiny. So we could probably fit, you know, fit all this uh, within a uh, design. Initially, I was like, I thought I had to build out my own radio system because I was trying to fit it within the size constraints. Um, and then I realized, oh, actually, somebody will do that for me. Um, and then uh, last, uh, unforeseen hard problems. So doing that localization with light um, off the TV takes some period of time. Uh, flashing uh, information from the TV is not a particularly fast scheme. And while I can be uh, trying to be very careful with how much brightness shifts I work with, um, it's still like somewhat noticeable to your eyes. So as a user experience, I figure it's probably not super great if every time you pick up and move your thing, the screen goes flash, 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 flash. Um, instead, if you're really, really cool, if I'm including that inertial measurement unit, I pick up the, the, the measure, it effectively dead reckons off of itself using the inputs from the inertial measurement unit to figure out where it's been you know, moving place on the TV, and now with some degree of uncertainty around it, we have an idea this mini has moved to this new location. I only need to flash in this location to confirm that it's where I think it is, and then we can update the system. Um, yeah, that's really hard off an IMU. So the left uh, graph, the red line is the, so, so first off, uh, an IMU uh, in this case is an accelerometer plus gyroscope. The important part for this is mostly the accelerometer. It measures acceleration. Gravity is a constant force of acceleration, as well as me accelerating around is accelerate. I'm accelerating it to get it to move. The problem is it's not measuring velocity, it's not measuring position. So how do we get that from acceleration? Well, from acceleration, we can get velocity by integrating over time once. So we basically multiply by our time step, the acceleration we see. We now have velocity. We add that to our previous idea of what velocity was. We can update velocity. We take that time step, multiply it by that you know, number again. Now we can actually calculate positions. So we can calculate our differential position. So it's double integrating over time. The red number is velocity. Um, it's estimation of what the velocity is over time. And you can kind of see it's kind of like biasing in a direction because there's noise on this system. That like line just going up is over one second of time, it being about 20 centimeters off. The right side. Gravity is an acceleration, right? Well, if I am not entirely precise on where I think the gravity vector is to subtract it from my acceleration of the system, and I'm off by one degree over one second, we're eight meters away. Problem. <laughs> uh, so basically where I'm at right now is I probably can't immediately do this. Um, this is a known hard problem. This is not just me screwing things up. Um, what is interesting is that there is, uh, I found some interesting uh, uh, research that 20, kind of 2020 onwards of uh, using machine learning mod uh, models to interpret the raw IMU data and use that to get position. Um, and this one paper, like they were claiming like 1.1% translational error across 4.2 kilometers, which just seems insane to me. But I have found similar-ish claims from other people uh, using only accelerometers and gyroscopes to have very small uh, positional errors. So if within the realm of possible, and maybe within the realm of possible for my product uh, project, um, obviously uh, they they can kind of constrain certain ways because like they're like doing it for like a car. Well, you can have a model of a car, you know that a car is not going to violently accelerate vertically. Uh, where if I'm picking up this thing, like it can kind of accelerate in any direction. Um, with this, like they're doing all this AI stuff, but uh, I, I would like it to be self-contained. There is a thing for that, uh, tiny ML slash uh, TensorFlow like <laughs> microcontrollers um, is trying to run machine learning models on microcontrollers. And the, the task that I'm trying to do is probably bounded enough to fit within that. Um, and then obviously I could consider expanding that initial uh, requirement of as minimal as possible be like, well, what if I have like one camera or two cameras mounted to the TV watching it, using that for rough position as you move. Um, but the cut line is that that is a whole other project in and of itself. I have to keep myself focused on what the current project is. So we're we'll probably just tabling that for now and I'm just making a bunch of notes for myself. Um, but uh, yeah, that's my last slide. I, I almost made it in time. <laughs> uh, any uh, immediate questions? Oh.
how long does it take for you to, I mean, I understand that you were rastering the screen, but that, that pattern you were showing is pretty cool. How long does that take? So in theory, you should be able to do it as basically one frame, every frame sends one bit of information. And on a reasonable size screen, I only need to send like, I think it was like 16, 17 ish bits of information that includes some checksum information. Um, so you can do it theoretically within a second. Okay, it, so it's it, a second, but that's a pretty um, long period of time, yeah. right? Uh, yeah, so you move it and like basically at best, it's a second, but due to real world of like, well, like how synced am I with the TV? It does take me some period of time to sample the screen below me and it's not like a millisecond, it's like 25, 30 milliseconds to sample. Uh, you might expand that out and be like, well, like two frames, uh, just for safety margin to make sure that I successfully transmit this information. Well, now two seconds to update my position. Um, so that's why yeah, I was trying to optimize it. Like flashing at you, right? Yeah, and with it flashing. And like, I can be pretty subtle with it, um, but obviously not, not like zero flashes. Take a ignorant question. I'm assuming that TVs, that are, they're, they're not capable of generating signals outside the visible spectrum. I'm assuming that. No, I mean, I'm, it's, it's, I'm constrained to uh, what the, the three uh, the three colors that the, it has pixels for. Okay. Because uh, that would be nice if I could send like infrared or something to the TV. I was going to ask is can you can you just tell the user to slide so that solves your IMU with the acceleration? I think it probably helps to a degree. Yeah. Um, but uh, if it, if it's something that's not just me and my friends, then I think I have to consider that random Joe is just going to sure. pick it up and move it and, and expect that to work because it's a reasonable expectation. <laughs> um, and so because of that, it's like now we have made the problem with it. Well, that yeah, as cool. you're looking at MDP, it might be one of the yeah. Oh yeah, MDP is like we're just gonna try to localize on the light center. We can build version two before I even try to sell anything. If I, if I were. So is the search parallel though? So that time increment you know, binds all the pieces. Yep. Arbitrarily, many of them. Yes. Could be found because every so, basically every cell is sending its location because it doesn't know where the mini. Yeah. Is. So it doesn't get worse if you have fifteen. No. Versions. Yeah. It does not. It does not scale with number of minis. It is a fixed time to send coordinate data, and then however many minis you were to have, if you had a hundred on there, that would take no longer up to a certain period of time to sample each one of those minis, which I can largely do in parallel because of uh, you know, Bluetooth. You can, be fairly noisy. It's and the caveat is that's not if you narrow down to where you think they are, because then you're sampling just a small area, correct? Right? That doesn't really. Uh, I guess you could you could say that that probably changes the time because you don't technically need to send as many bits because you could basically be testing: Are you within this region? If you are, then I'm only sending, you know, five by five as opposed to a twenty by forty grid, uh, so you can send fewer bits. So it could be faster just to do the test. Yeah. Okay, so this is kind of geeky, but. Since this is part of a system, I'm assuming you would also know the maximum distance each character can move. Uh, I think you could, and that actually would be a very good thing to try to circle. constrain uh, to create, create, create a model. Um, so that's actually yeah, it's not not a not a bad thought. I, I guess you could also because of this, if, depending on what system you're using, if you're using Foundry, you know where walls theoretically are, and so you could say, all right, well, what is a reasonable path that this person could even be getting to like they're not going to trace the path by themselves, exactly, yeah. but they will pick it up and move to the end of the path. And be like, what are valid paths even? So that would actually would be a really good. Yeah, they yeah. catching cheaters would be good for that. Uh, yeah. no, I mean, it's, it's you and your friends. There's no <laughs> cheating. <laughs> <laughs> We're not, this is not an online game where I actually have to force anything. Uh, I'll give you first, then. Um, it looked like you using black and white for the sensor. If you use a color sensor, you have that down there. Yeah. So. Yeah, no. Is that your question too? Uh, yeah, so the, the light sensor I'm using right now actually is color uh, sensitive. Um, the problem that I have is that I can't just be specifically like, have like a, a sensor that's specifically sensitive to like wavelength and like sample really, really fast. Really what I have to do is I have to collect photons over some period of time. Otherwise there's just too much noise and I can't really piece it apart. The sensor I'm using has four color channels, uh, red, green, blue, general brightness. I'm only using the general brightness. I originally was using the color channels. The problem is that the sensor does not let you skip channels or ch uh, uh, sample in parallel. Because uh, it's basically reusing like the capacitor between all of them. 
And so if you were to put some of the data in one color and some of the data in the other, you would have to read one frame here, one frame there anyway, you got enough speed up. It, it's very frustrating to me, but I can't find a sensor at a reasonable price point that actually would let me do that without just being like, well, what if I duplicate sensors? And they're like two to $3 per sensor. So that is not a good scale in their uh, cost. Um, but yes, uh, very frustrating. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Thank you. All right. Cool. All right. I got a short one. Then uh, EJ, you ready? Yeah. Um. So this past couple of weeks, um, Scott and his son Luke have been working on walling the staircase in the front there. So for anybody who doesn't know, we're building our own building. We've been building our own building for the past about seven years. There's a staircase on that end of the building and for fire code, apparently you need two ways to get out of the upstairs. So uh, I don't know why they do that, but building code and whatnot. Um, and then uh, Jim and Sean and Tom and I were working on framing uh, this past weekend. So we just, I just made a time lapse of the um, framing running to a hair over a minute. So. Uh, we basically wanted to make the wall sort of planar. We originally were trying to figure out how to get this in and make a straight line wall because the staircase comes down uh, inside of an existing wall that we had for the bathroom wall. So we set a ledger on the wall and put the wall just on the exterior of the wall. Um, I uh, hope someday when someone's tearing this building apart, they're like, why the hell did they do this? It makes no sense. <laughs> um, but in order to get enough space, uh, we had to uh, make that work out. We're also gonna reuse one of the original building windows from this building. It's one of the three by three, like a nine panel factory window, the really traditional tip out windows. So that's what's getting framed in on the right side. And then all of our doors for the building have come from other buildings. So Mark and I went upstairs and dug around to find a frame and a door that would theoretically fit. And Sean didn't give us too much shit because it actually did fit, which was good. Um, but we have a variety of hinge spacing and door spacing and door sizes uh, upstairs. So sometimes it's a pain in the ass to find something that'll work. Um, but anyway, uh, I was just gonna show that. Our next kind of step on that is pun intended. We're going to put a plate along the wall for the handrail catch. So we have some track that's going to go along the wall. So we have something to mount the handrail to. And then we're going to drywall the inside of the wall. We've got to run some electrical. And then uh, we can get this inspected, the bathrooms upstairs inspected. And then our next fun thing is to cut a hole through the wall so we can drywall the inside of the elevator shaft. Then the elevator company comes and puts the elevator pieces in, uh, hopefully. So any questions about any of that craziness yeah drywall inside of the elevator yeah so the inside of the elevator shaft gets drywalled uh full fully drywalled no exposed final material because the the elevator is hydraulic hydraulic fluid if it's vaporized has this problem of just burning really fast and so they want to have the whole inside of the shaft drywalled and then it's got a sprinkler at the top and a sprinkler in the middle um so that it minimizes the the odds that that turns into a big column of fire Fun stuff. Any other questions? If, I think I know this, but just in grand strokes, what's the vision for upstairs versus downstairs? And when, when it's all said and done, what's what's going on in the building? Dave might stuff? be a plant. Um, <laughs> so the, from the where the sector logo is at the Mobius strip or the, the countdown timer, pick your reference. From that wall this way is where all these office desk spaces are going to go. So the front half of upstairs will be all shared desk spaces. There's a bathroom above this bathroom, straight upstairs. And then the elevator's kind of in the front. That's the weird bump on the side of the building. Uh, so the front half will be offices. The back half will stay storage until we have a need for something different. And then in the very, very back, there's a caretaker's quarters, like an apartment uh, back in the corner that's already built and done. Uh, down here, the room, that's where all this long table set is. If you're ever at the old shop, we had a, a room that was called an event space. This is a whole shitload of tables and chairs and rooms generally stayed empty. Uh, so this middle part of the building is going to turn into that space again. The wall that we just created is going to define the classroom space. So that front right corner of the building when you come in as a classroom, uh, like a projector and a bunch of computers. And then this will get split into two conference rooms. And there's a fancy word for the middle section of the building, which is called flex space. Flex space is architect speak for we don't know what the hell we're going to do. Uh, and so flex in this case, um, you know, who knows? There's another garage door. Uh, which could potentially be more auto workspace or who knows what uh, for kind of larger projects. So the evolution of the building is very slow, as no doubt people have noticed over the years. The catch is that we've been doing this with all volunteers. 
for the most part, except for things that legally we had to hire, like the elevator has to get installed by an elevator contractor, we would think. Um, and then uh, everything else has been basically volunteers over the years. And the building's been built without any debt, so we haven't taken on like a mortgage or a loan or anything. It's all been built with uh, materials as well that are salvaged. So we generally go through a great deal of extra effort to reuse things rather than uh, throw stuff away and buy new stuff, primarily out of affordability. Uh, stuff is really expensive. Other questions? All right, EJ, I've given you as much time as, you, as you're going to get. So <laughs> you're up next. Well, hopefully I can keep it pretty short. EJ uh, asked if he, he looked very scared that he was going to be stuck up going first. So we've been buying in time now. And I always last instead. So. Yes. This is ASCII Arch. <laughs> What's ASCII mean? American Standard International Code. The international or something or other. <laughs> it's the characters that we type on the keyboard. That's it is. Yeah. <laughs> so it's characters uh, used to make pictures. And I'm going to use it to talk about what I always talk about, which is language. And specifically, I want to basically try and define two new terms that are not currently part of the lexicon, but I hope will become part of like words that are just things people know. <clears throat> Those words are syntax locked and syntax free. You can think of syntax locked as basically just a language. Language always has a specific syntax, specific vocabulary and grammar. And Syntax free is basically pictures. The term of pictures worth a thousand words. The reason it's worth a thousand words is because it's not language, it's not English, it's not French. It's just a picture. So this similarly is just a picture. But I've just I've created a language to illustrate this point called ASCII Lang. And it just has three letters. It has an X and an O and a period used for spaces. So be where you can reference your handout if you show us the key to headache inducing. Paper. Yeah, so some of you have this little piece of paper here. It <laughs> describes ASCII line, and it describes that it has these three letters, X and O and period. And then it gives you one sentence. There's actually some spaces in there which are actually not meant to be there. But there's two sentences that describe two pictures using ASCII line. And the prize is if somebody was able to, and I'm curious if anybody has been able to decode, what ASCII picture is being described by those two sentences? I think I figured some stuff out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Sounds like I'm so going to give us something 25 bucks. That would be awesome. I, I didn't figure out all of it, but it, it looks like the maybe an accident at all. Winner, winner, oh, chicken winner. Nice. Well, that's fantastic. All right. So these are the two sentences. This is what he decoded. You didn't film down at the beginning of the meeting. Soon, soon. <laughs> yeah, I said it was it was before everybody else found out. And you're about to find out in the next like two slides. So we're on our way here. Uh, all right. So this is basically what was on that sheet of paper. Are these two sentences? And the question is, are they the same thing? Are they different? How are they different? And I'm curious, how long did it take you to go from like reading the challenge to actually having that picture in your brain? It would have then taken some time to actually draw it out and whatnot, but what was that time frame, roughly? I think it was a couple of presentations. <laughs> so what is that? Maybe like... Oh, well, you looked at this last time. Five minutes. No, I see. Oh, today. I, oh, I see. Yes. Oh, I see. You've been looking at it. I see. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so it's right. like the beginning of the first one. Okay, so, so more than a few seconds. Yes. Okay. So this is what he decoded correctly. Beautiful. This is that same information described in English. So if you all read this, you could then theoretically also draw the picture uh, that we have there. What I'm gonna do in a moment though, is I'm gonna skip to a syntax free version of what we're gonna see for five seconds, and then we'll see where we're at. Oops. <laughs> It was literally the same information, same letters of the alphabet, same number of letters, except that one is arranged into a language, one dimension, it's just a sequence of tokens, 
And so I had to first take this picture, this picture, and I had to encode it in ASCII line. And then, sorry, remind me of your name? Jacob. Jacob. Jacob had to spend more than the five seconds you guys got to look at this and decode it. And then he was able to draw a picture of this because this is what was in those, those, that sequence of characters. It's just the sequence of characters is an ordered list of tokens. And to first, it has to be encoded. And then anybody that wants to know what's in it has to then decode it, which takes time and is error prone. And there's actually errors in there. So I think you drew it correctly, but that may not actually be what's on the piece of paper because there's a couple of typos in there, inadvertently, as it turns out. But similarly, those typos are sort of inscrutable. In this case, there are two typos. And I'd be shocked if it takes anybody more than a few seconds to locate. Because they're, they're just so obvious. Because it's not a sentence somewhere that says, oh, and this one then is an O, and then after that, there's another X. This, by the way, I can describe these. It's an X and an O. This is the correct inversion. It's an X and an O, drawn with X's and O's, and periods as spacers. It's a big five by, sorry, eight by five X, I mean, eight by five O with the X on the left and the O on the right. And then it's the same thing again with the O on the right and the X on the left. So the last like 30 seconds or a minute of this, the transcript of this presentation also encodes this same information. Again, in English, it's lots of words. You have to know English. We don't speak English. It's as opaque as those X's and O's were on the paper to most people that look at it and that would look at it. It's locked up. It's a sequence of, of tokens. It's not efficient. This is syntax free. This syntax locked in English. Same information, literally the same facts. In this case, using English descriptions. Here, using ASCII line. In this case, ASCII, ASCII line has um, just one character. Uh, it has, sorry, ASCII line has three characters an X, an O, and a period, which makes it a little easier to draw stuff. But if you wanted to create an X made out of X's and an O made out of O's, and the only two letters in your language is a hashtag and a period, you now need to start building words. Because you need a word, say, hashtag, hashtag, which means X. And another word, let's say, hashtag, period, that means O. And then we could use period, period to mean period. And now we have, with just two letters and the hashtag only language, a way to describe this as well. It'd be a different sequence of things. There'd be no Xs, there'd be no Os. They'd all be hashtags as they are on that piece of paper. There's no one back there, so everybody wants to look. Different language, same information. It'd be harder to read, it'd be harder to parse. Same information. Syntax locked. So that's basically the two terms, syntax locked, syntax free. You can think of syntax locked as just being language. And that language can be English, French, Python, C sharp, any language, programming, formal languages. If it is expressed as a sequence of tokens that need to be ordered in a very specific way in order to encode and lock up the knowledge they're trying to capture, that's syntax locked. And it is not an efficient way to encode information. Questions? So EJ, yeah. I, I think it started in your sink in. So you're you're demonstrating using a different an atypical set of tokens, mm -hmm. how our language works to describe something, as, a, as opposed to you, you have not come up with an, an encoding scheme or an encryption scheme. Because that would be a language. Okay. It's definitely not a language. In fact, you can just take all the languages off away. What's left is going to do this. So a couple of key classifiers in terms of what distinguishes these two things is that a language is always going to be a description of the idea. In other words, I described in English the shape of the X drawn with an X and the O drawn with those. I'm describing an idea. It's kind of an abstract idea, actually. 
That was an English description. I used ASCII lang to describe that same idea. I used hashtag only lang to describe that same idea again. The difference between all of those descriptions, all of those linguistic descriptions of an X, the thing that they share, that differentiates this, this is a mirror of the idea. This is not a description of an X, you know. It's a mirror of it. And if we decide to put the X above the O, we can take that X and move it over there, and we're done. It's not a description. I just described it in English first, what I was about to do. But in here, we would literally be moving it physically. And so it's the fact that it has two dimensions. The reason the picture's worth a thousand words, specifically because it has two dimensions. In language, you just have a list of words in some order. And some idea is at like word 2,500 in the document. As soon as you have a picture, you now have both an X and a Y. And if you have a 3D model of something, you now have three coordinates. Ideas are multi-dimensional. They're not linear. And so this model can be expanded to build a model of any idea, not as a description of the idea, but an actual like, a simple way to think about it with software is that if you just find any no-code tool, sorry, any no-code tool, which is a tool that basically lets you build software without writing code, you're not dragging it about what it is. If you find a tool that lets you build the app you want, you have described the idea of your app. Whether that tool is the right tool or not for what you're trying to build, you've incorporated the rules of what you were thinking in there. And if you do it and it works like this is what I want. You can then export that whole thing as an export file, delete project, and then take it and re-import it. And if that tool then continues to work the way we would have thought about it, by definition, that file incorporates your entire idea, surpassed it, so took it away, deleted it, and then just imported this one file and it all came back. That file is not a description of the project. It's not going to be like an English description of what you built. It's going to be a JSON file. It's going to be a multi-dimensional description of your idea. And in fact, you should be able to look at it and see whatever you built there in that file, probably. But either way, that when you're building it, you're not describing it. You're not typing descriptions of what you're trying to build. You're just building it. Once it does what you want, that's it. That's right. Because it actually exists. That was a little abstract, sorry. Uh, any other questions? I'm also going to be here afterwards. I'm going to talk about this as well. So, I mean, I think it's sort of what I'm saying as well, but it's still a lot to, a lot to digest. But the idea that all language is syntax locked makes sense to me. It's linear, it's, it's a long tape ribbon that you have to start at one end of the tape, use the rules to get there. Yeah. But so often, language, as we read language, that's not the end goal. The end goal is to interpret what we're reading, mm -hmm. and therefore it turns into a syntax-free image in our mind. Totally. Yep. So, so is that true to say that syntax locks is used to get to a syntax-free interpretation of the information? At the moment, it is. So at the moment, we write a document, and then we can hand that to people, and they can read the document, and then they form an understanding in their brain. Like if somebody read the transcript of the part where I was describing these, or decodes it from that and draws pictures of it in their mind, that's then no longer an ASCII line picture. Like once you figured out what was being drawn there, it, it, it wasn't an ASCII line thing. The picture he drew was a picture. And so when we read, we read and it's English and it goes into our brain. And if I then turn around and need to explain that idea in Spanish to somebody else, I don't need it explained to me again in Spanish because in my brain, it's not a Spanish idea. X and no. We don't usually write down that idea. We don't create a model of the idea. We create descriptions of it. And then if that description is wrong and people read it and they're like, no, that's not right, we then write more words to explain how the other words were wrong. And they're just keeping more and more and more and more and more words. And there's just an X and a no. So if we build that until we add a Z or something else, that's it. We're done. We can then talk about it, we can describe it, we can document it, we can break code based on it. 
function creating the non-linear version. First. Okay, thank you, EJ. With EJ afterwards, I'm sure. Yep. Have, uh... I will. I'm going to 25 bucks. <laughs> I mean, I'm, 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 that's 25 bucks I've ever spent. I was going to say, I'm pretty sure EJ is banking on nobody solving it. So, yeah, you got some. Oh, yeah, but 25 bucks. Yeah. I do it on my phone. <laughs> All right. We kill off the zooms. Uh,